Did you know that 2017 was in fact the safest year on record for flying an aircraft? There's never been a safer year to fly. Now it is true that some people did die on aeroplanes. There were 10 incidents in 2017, 44 people passed away and 35 people on the ground. And while those numbers are terrible, 36 million aircraft took off in 2017. Yeah, that's right, 36 million. That means that your chance of something happening to you on an aeroplane is one in many millions. When you take those statistics and compare them to other things, it means that fireworks, bee stings, the furniture in your house, food, the flu, lightning strikes, even a meteorite strike perhaps, are statistically more probable than something happening to you on an aeroplane. It means that when you're on an aeroplane, if you're eating some food, that food is more dangerous to you than the, the flight itself. But if you've eaten aeroplane food, then you know that's true. You know, it's funny, isn't it? Even though we know the fear statistically is irrational, many of us when we fly, and maybe you are one of these people, I was for many years, we're nervous, we're scared when we get onto an aeroplane, especially takeoff. You know, there's something funny about takeoff. It's, it's designed to rattle you. You know, all of the, the buzzers are going, there's, there's lights and things beeping, uh, announcements are being made, people are being told to take their seats. There's the sounds, lights are turning off, there's strange noises. And suddenly the engines then spool up and this metal tube that you're in starts to shake a little bit and shudder as it starts to hurtle down the runway with you, all these people, and thousands of tons of aeroplane and fuel about to take off into the sky. You see, that's the scary thing about that moment. In that moment, when you're there about to take off and as you're going down the runway, there's no turning back. You have to go through with the process. And perhaps that's what scares us so much. We can't get out of it. We effectively have to surrender ourselves and let the captain, him or her, do their job and let aerodynamics take over. All of us, in some degree or another, struggle with this idea of surrender. It's not natural to us. We fight surrender. We fight this idea of letting go. Even if we know the thing that we're needing to surrender to could possibly be for our good. We think of armies surrendering. They lose. We think of sports people surrendering. We always think of surrender in terms of defeat. And yet the scriptures tell us something different. The scriptures suggest to us that in fact surrender, letting go, could potentially not be what means we lose, but instead could be the very thing we need to do in order to get to where we wanna go, especially when it comes to faith. I'd like to show you today what a Jewish man named Paul, what he said in a book called Philippians, in fact, it's a letter, he wrote to a church in a, in a town called Philippi and he shared with them his experience of letting go to God and how in that process of letting go, he actually found what he was looking for. We find this in Philippians 3, verses 7 and 8. Let's read these verses together now. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. Notice what Paul has just said. And it's pretty powerful. He's just said that he considers the loss of everything in his life worth having Jesus. He says he's prepared to give up everything and anything and he'll count those things. He uses strong language like rubbish, he says, if it means he can have Jesus. Now, we might read this and say, oh, Paul's just exaggerating. It's hyperbole. He's just going, you know, overboard. But it's interesting, if you just backtrack a few verses in Philippians chapter 3, take a look at what Paul actually says he gave up. We can read this in verses 4 to 6 now. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. 
circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Notice what Paul says he's ready to give up. It's his entire identity, who he was before he came to know Jesus. It's huge, it's, it's massive what he's actually saying. Now, notice Paul's not saying he stops being himself. Oh, he's still him. But he's saying that anything in his old life that got in the way, that, that he sees as, a, as an impediment now to being with Jesus, he says he's ready to let go of. Now, why is Paul ready to make such a sacrifice? Why is he ready to do this, to take this massive step in his life? While I don't have proof that Paul had read these verses or these words, it seems to me that Paul understood exactly you see, Jesus himself had something to say about just what Paul had done in his life in order to become a follower of his. We find these words in Matthew 16, verses 24 to 27. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Jesus' point here is incredibly powerful. And it's backwards. It goes against all of our natural instincts. What he's saying is if you want to save your life, he says, lose it. He says, if, if you want to be in my kingdom, he goes, don't hold on tighter. He says, do the very opposite. He says, let go instead. It's backwards to how we normally think. We think in terms of our personal identity, preserving who we are, making sure that nothing threatens it. And Jesus says, in fact, that's exactly what threatens you when it comes to my kingdom and knowing me and going on this journey of faith. You can break down what Jesus has said into a couple of things. And the first thing we see is that those who want to follow Christ, he says, they don't live for themselves. It doesn't mean that they won't have anything for themselves, but what he says is, he says, come to me with your, your goals and your plans and your personal agendas and, and offer them up to me. Not that I might cancel them or cancel your plans or change everything, but maybe I know things, maybe I foresee things, maybe I have plans for you that you can't even imagine or conceive of or understand how, when you give them to me, things could go. The second thing that Jesus says here, is that following him does require some sacrifice. And he doesn't say this without context or without himself offering up himself and giving sacrifice for us too. We know from scripture that Jesus made the ultimate sacrifice for all of us. And he says for those who follow him, there could be sacrifices to make as well. It might mean having things go in a way that you never expected. It might mean missing out on something that you wanted. But again, he comes back to Paul's point. He says, if you see what you want in me and want to go after that, then the cost of those sacrifices, it, it's not a cost at all. It's a cost, but not one that you mind because you see what you're gaining in return. You're gaining Christ Jesus himself. The third thing is this idea of living in this inverted reality. It's back to front. Most of us have grown up in a world that tells us that we need to fight for ourselves, that we need to protect what we've got, that we need to, to defend who we are. And then Jesus comes along and he flips it all over. He says, if you want to lose your life, then, then try to save it. And if you want to save your life, then let go, give it to me, lose the thing. And in that process, you will, you will get what you want. It's backwards, it's, it's inverted, it's, it's back to front. It's like driving on the wrong side of the road. It's like putting your, your shirt on the, the wrong way and suddenly it's the right way. Naturally, we don't think we can do it. I'm left-handed and for all my life, people have commented on how it's backwards. They go, that looks so hard. And for me, it seems natural. Jesus is making a similar point to us. He's saying, my kingdom is backwards, but if you try it, it will totally make sense. And the last thing that these verses remind us of is that we need to think eternally as well. So often we're thinking about today or this week or next month, and that's all right. We need these realities to be present in our mind. But Jesus reminds us as well that there's more to this life, that there's 
life beyond. And that if, as we're living our life, we only think of now, we only think of this moment, then we won't be ready for the eternity that's coming. Paul realized, you see, that what Jesus said was true. He was ready to make the sacrifice of all things that he had in order to gain Christ. It made sense to Paul. It's what Jesus said at the end of that passage we just read. He said, if that's the way you're prepared to live, then far from losing your life, Jesus said, you will find your life. In his devotional book, My Utmost for His Highest, writer Oswald Chambers says this, the characteristics of individuality are independence and self-assertiveness. It is the continual assertion of individuality that hinders our spiritual life more than anything else. I know what you're thinking. Well, that's hard. I, I, I like who I am. I like my individuality. I like to be an assertive person. Easier said than done right, letting go. You're absolutely right. These are some of the most challenging things that Jesus said. Some people consider Jesus' words in Matthew 16 some of the hardest things he ever said. And throughout Jesus' ministry, many people who followed him, they did turn around and went their own way because they realized they just couldn't make that surrender. Maybe you remember the story of the rich young ruler. He came to Jesus and asked him, and he said, what do I have to do to be saved? And Jesus challenged him because he saw he loved his riches. And Jesus said, well, give everything you've got away to the poor and come and follow me. Some people read that story and go, oh, does that mean if I'm rich? No, <laughs> it means that Jesus saw in this man what his challenge was, what was holding him back. And it was that thing that Jesus asked him to let go of. What holds you and I back though? What are the inhibitors to letting go? Well, there's two things that we have to be on the lookout for when it comes to ourselves and what might hold us back. And those two things are fear and pride. The plane is a great example. We've all got onto an airplane. We've all sat there. And if you have experienced that fear of having to fly, then you know it, it is what holds you back. You know it, what it is that makes you scared. It's that you realize that you're not in control anymore. You realize that you're somewhere where you have to give yourself over to someone else. The outcome's not certain. The outcome's not in your hands. You're literally putting your lives into the hands of someone else. You're putting yourself into someone else's control. That's what's so scary about this situation. That's why we're afraid. That's why we don't like it. A pride is similar, but it's different. Pride says, well, I want to be an individual. I want to stand out. I want others to see me in a certain way. I want to be seen the way that I want to be seen. I want to control the narrative. I want to be the one creating the frame and the lens through which people see me. This idea of letting go, this idea of surrendering, says that we're not in control of any of this anymore. It says that we're happy for God to be in control and for Him to be the one that drives us forward, leads us forward, and guides us on this journey that we want to go with Him. It's frightening, but it's amazing. The other thing we have to consider, though, is this, and it's a great question. Why are we afraid of God? Why are we afraid of the plans that He might have for our life? Do we imagine somehow that what we have, or what He has, rather, for us, is worse than what we would choose for ourselves. Now, I've got two little boys and often I'll put something in front of them. I'll put a food that they've never tried before and they'll look at it and they'll screw up their faces and go, Dad, that looks yuck. We don't want to eat that, Dad. <laughs> and I'll coax them and my wife as well. We'll coax them. Come on, boys, try it. It's delicious. And they'll sort of bring the fork or the spoon up to their mouth and they'll put it in and you watch the eyes light up. <laughs> Mom, Dad, this is amazing. This is fantastic. Why didn't you tell us? And we say, well, we did. <laughs> we did tell you. We told you it's going to be good for you. We told you you would like it. And then it's funny. Often they'll ask for that every night for dinner for the next week. We need to stop believing that what we want for ourselves, and I know this is a hard idea, is the very best thing. Sometimes the things that others want for us 
and especially when it comes to God, He wants the very best for us. In a wonderful little book called Steps to Christ, the author writes these words, and I'd like to share them with you now about how God feels about you and I and the plans that He has for us in our life. In Steps to Christ, page 46, the author writes, but what do we give up when we give all? A sin-polluted heart for Jesus to purify, to cleanse by his own blood, and to save by his matchless love. And yet men think it hard to give up all. God does not require us to give up anything that is not in our best interest to retain. Would that all who have not chosen Christ might realize that he has something vastly better to offer them than they are seeking for themselves. You see, surrender has to change in our mind. Surrender has to stop being about the one we're surrendering to, wanting for us to somehow lose. I mean, take the plane, for example. When you get on the plane, have you ever doubted that the pilot, the one who you're surrendering control over to, doesn't want to get you there? Could you imagine that they want to take you to the wrong city or somehow want the plane to fail and, and not get there? Now, maybe you can think of some obscure example, but in all my years and on all the flights I've been on, I've only ever arrived at my destination. Yes, sometimes late, sometimes it took longer than I expected, but I got there in the end. God wants us to take this same thinking. He wants us to realize that He's the one who wants to get us there. He's the one who wants to save us from some of the plans that He knows won't get us where we want to go. He's the one who wants to save us from ourselves because as we've discovered often in this series so far, we can be our own worst enemy. We have a tendency not to get to where we want to go. We have a tendency to be the very ones who derail themselves. A good friend of mine, Grant, often would say to me, Ben, people often push away from themselves the very things that they want. It seems that we have a hard time getting what we want and we have a hard time fighting with ourselves. Jesus says to us, stop fighting with yourself. Let go, give over to me, surrender totally. And in that experience, you will find perhaps for the first time a peace that you've never experienced, but the ability as well to go where you need to go. I love Jesus' example he gave to us. Maybe you've read about it in the Garden of Gethsemane where Jesus was about to surrender his life for the entire world. He was about to give himself over, surrender, and he was about to be crucified on a cross. The night before this happened, he was in a garden. Its name was Gethsemane. And there he pled with God. He didn't want to do it. He knew it was going to be hard. But as he wrestled with God, those beautiful words were spoken by him that have resonated down the ages where he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus knew that not everything he wanted was the best. He realized that in this situation, he needed to experience something, go through something that he knew would be for the good of the entire world, for all humanity but he still struggled with that and had to come to a place where he was ready to let go. It's the same for us as well. If Paul was here with us, if, if we weren't reading the letter, but he was we with us, he would say, just do it, <laughs> just do it. Just do it and see, just try and see. What have you got to lose? In Romans chapter 12 and verse one, in fact, Paul encouraged the people he was writing to, to do just that. And we read these words. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers and sisters, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. In a similar way, we find exactly this idea conveyed in just different words when Paul was writing to the Galatians, and we read now in Galatians 2, verse 20. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Notice what Paul's words have just said. He makes this dramatic statement. He goes, I've been crucified with Christ. He said, this life that I'm now living, it's not totally me, it's me. But he said, it's Christ living in me. This is the thing that 
we're perhaps afraid of, that we, we lose that individuality, that we lose that ability to be the one in control. But notice again, Paul explains, and it's what we've been looking at all day today, is that he does this because Christ is the one who loves him and has given his life for him. He's not putting himself in the hands of just anybody. He's not just going, fine, I'll just, I'll just give myself over. It's not like he's just in a car and just takes his hands off the wheel and is hoping for the best. He sees in Jesus someone totally trustworthy, someone totally lovely, someone totally beautiful, someone who has done something himself on his behalf that shows him that he can have total confidence that he can totally let himself go and put himself in the hands of this person. And knowing that when he does, his life will be safe in him, no matter what happens to his life, because he's put his hands into the life of someone who's given his life for himself in return. It's amazing. Paul invites all of us into this very same experience with Jesus. He's inviting us to let go as well, to surrender ourselves, knowing that Jesus has given everything for us in return. You know, this reminds me of a story I heard a number of years ago. I don't know if this story is true or not, so just bear with me today. But the story goes like this. There was a mountain climber and he wanted to climb the highest mountains, the Aconcagua in the Argentinian Andes. The man had decided that he wanted the glory for himself. He didn't want to travel with a team of other climbers. He didn't want it being spread around everyone. He wanted to do this alone. He wanted everyone to know what an amazing climber he was. And so off he headed into the mountains, into the Andes, and began his ascent up the mountain. Well, the climb, as you can imagine, was difficult, but he was good. And as he continued to climb up the mountains, darkness began to fall, the sun began to set. Things got hard to see, but he continued on his climb, wanting to reach the top, wanting to get there in record time and wanting to, the glory, I guess, of, of making it to the top. Well, at one point in the climb, as he was about to get on top of one ridge, uh, he, was, he was climbing when suddenly uh, his foot placement or hand placement, I can't be sure, but one of them, he, he slipped. And, in, and he wasn't able to grab onto the rock again, and instead he just began to free fall. Well, thankfully he had put the points into the rock. Again, I'm not a climber, but those points that climbers use, he had secured himself in. And as he was falling, 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 thinking maybe that this is it, suddenly the ropes went tight and suddenly he was jolted from his free fall and was suddenly now swinging in midair. Well, because he had decided to climb in the pitch dark, he, he couldn't see a thing. He didn't know where he was. And so as he hung there, thinking, what's he gonna do? Trying to reach for something, but unable to, 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 to feel anything in the dark or see anything at all, he realized he needed some help. Now, he wasn't a particularly religious man, a spiritual man, but in that moment, he thought, why not reach out to God? And the man, he started to pray, God, please save me from this predicament that I'm in. Please help me. And as the story goes, the man had this distinct impression, almost like a voice, but the thought, clear and audible in his mind, cut the rope, cut the rope. Well, the man is there hanging. He thinks, well, there's no way I'm cutting the rope. I'm still alive. I'm still okay. I'm still secure. There's no way I'm going to cut the one thing that's keeping me from falling. I'm going to stay here. I'm going to hold on. And the thought kept coming back, cut the rope cut the rope, but the man refused. I don't know how much time it was, but a number of climbers later came through and they found that climber. He was frozen to death on that mountain. The thing that they couldn't understand though about the climber is that he was dangling above a ledge only two feet away. Had the man cut the rope, he would have fallen two more feet safely onto a ledge, been able to regroup resume the climb, get into shelter, and not have frozen to death. Now, as I said, I don't know if this story is true. I can't prove that to you today, but I hope you'll take the point. So often, like this climber, you and I are in a situation that's dire. We find ourselves in hard circumstances and we reach out to God and God has a message for us that makes no sense. 
it doesn't make sense what he says. It feels like what he wants for us could be the end of us, when in fact, it could be the very making of us and the saving of our lives. I want to ask you today, where are you at with God? Are you nervous when it comes to giving your life over to Him? Are you scared that if you do, you might lose something that you love, that you might not go in the direction that you want? Could I challenge you today? Why not give it a go? Why not trust Him? Look at what Christ has done for you. Look at what the Scriptures say, God, the lengths that He's gone for us. Why would a God who loves us that much want to take us somewhere where we don't want to go? As we close today, I'd love to pray for you now. Let's pray and ask God to help us as we think and consider of taking this very scary but awesome and important step. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we want to thank you today so much for your love for us. We want to thank you for what you achieved for us on the cross and the fact that you were willing to give up of yourself, that you were willing to surrender for us so that we might have eternal life. We want to ask you today that you would help us surrender as well, that you would help us to let go of situations that, Lord, are already out of our control. We want to pray that we would trust you, that we would know that you won't won't betray that trust and Lord that you might take us somewhere we never expected Lord but always with our best interest in heart we thank you that we can claim these promises today and we ask now that you would be with us as we consider them and as we find the courage to do them and we ask these these things today in Jesus name amen maybe our presentation today has left you with more questions who is Jesus and what it is about him that is so interesting. Why are so many people drawn to him and ready to commit their life to him? Our free offer today is the Walking with Jesus study guide. We'd love to give this offer to you. In it, you will be able to dig deeper, find out more about who Jesus is and why so many people are drawn to him. Some of the topics in this series is God's love for man, what it looks like to confess the things that we've done wrong, what God is like, how to have faith in Him, and how to live our life with Him every day. To receive this free offer, please visit our website, truthlink.tv forward slash Jesus, or call us on 1300 300 389 and ask for the Walking with Jesus free offer.